Okay, guys. Um, really excited to be here. I was actually on the, the phone with my wife last night. I live in Toronto. Um, and uh, I was talking to her and, you know, she said, are you, are you nervous for your presentation tomorrow? And I said, no, you know, I've, I've given a variation of this talk a few times. And she said, well, you should be nervous because you're speaking in Poland and you always brag to me how smart, you know, Polish people are. Um, so you better prepare and you better, uh, you know, make sure that you're on your game. And she really intimidated me um, and I didn't sleep very well last night because I'm always uh, telling her uh, how, you know, bright you guys are. Uh, for example, when we have our programming contest at Infusion, our Krakow office always wins. It always beats out Toronto and New York and so forth. Uh, so I didn't sleep a lot last night. I was preparing, and I, and I hope that preparation pays off. Um, so we're going to be speaking today about, you know, uh, one of the topics that I, I love speaking about the most. Um, it is fascinating, not only as it applies to technology, but really to the development of our species and, you know, questions about our relationship with technology and so forth. Um, so we're going to be talking about deep learning, neural networks, the latest in artificial intelligence, and really how this is culminating in what some people are call calling super intelligence. So I hope by the end of this you'll have a very good understanding of what this uh, development is all about. Um, you know, oftentimes when we hear a lot about exciting topics, we're not sure whether or not it's a fad or whether or not it really has significant implications for computing and technology and our relationships with machines. I hope by the end of this that you'll see it's actually very much the latter, that this is incredibly significant and, you know, can have huge implications um, for technology in the next 10, 10 15, uh, 30 years. So we're going to begin by talking about what was a monumental achievement in the realm of artificial intelligence about four or five months ago. And I'm not sure how many of you followed this or are familiar with um, what happened here. What is this? I see a few nods, right? What was this? This was AlphaGo. So this was the computer that was designed by DeepMind, which was a Google you know, type company, that played the world champion, Lee Sedol, in the ancient game of Go. And what is fascinating about what happened here is that before the event, most experts predicted that the world champion would win decisively, right? There was five games that were played. On consensus, most people believed that the human would win four games to one. And in fact, we had the exact reverse scoreline. So the computer won four games, the human champion won one, and this was seen as hugely significant in the artificial intelligence community. Right? Now, some of you may, may remember about you know, 20 years ago, uh, IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess. And people were saying back then that that was also monumental and it would be very significant. Right? What I hope to argue is that this is actually a lot more significant and actually a greater achievement than what we saw in 1997. So why was this achievement so significant? And why is it that experts in the field of AI were stunned by this development um, you know, for a number of reasons. Well, the first thing to realize is the complexity of Go. So when we talk about games from an artificial intelligence perspective, one of the things that the experts talk about is something called the branching factor. And so what that is, is on average, how many moves as a person do I have available to me at a particular point in the game, right? So the branching factor of chess is about 35. Meaning when I play chess and I start to play the game, I have about one of 35 moves. My opponent has one of 35 responses. I have 35 responses to that. And so very quickly, the tree, the, you know, the, the possible permutations in the game of chess becomes exponential very quickly. And in the 80s and 90s, computer scientists found ingenious ways to reduce the search space of chess. Right? They found all these interesting techniques. They used supercomputing hardware in the case of Deep Blue. And by about the late 90s, you know, they were about as good as the best players. In fact, some would argue that in 1997, Kasparov was actually better than Deep Blue, but kind of psyched himself out. Right? But by about the year 2000, there was no question that the best computers at chess were better than the best humans at chess. What is interesting about Go is that the branching factor is not 35. It is actually 300. And so after about, you know, 15 moves in Go, um, you have more Go, you know, permutations than the number of atoms in the universe. So traditional techniques that worked in chess and checkers and other games are completely intractable when it comes to Go. And so the complexity of Go 
was a real challenge for you know, AI proponents. Um, what also stunned people was the rapidity of the achievement and how quickly it was done. Most experts were not predicting that we'd have a computer play world championship level Go until the year 2050. And so that it happened in 2016 and happened out of the blue. It's not like there was a steady progression of machines that slowly got better and slowly got better. It just literally came out of nowhere in about one or two years. That was also a huge surprise. But what was probably most significant about what DeepMind did was how they approached the problem. They didn't um, you know, use specialized circuitry and years of research like Deep Blue did in 1997. They, in fact, used neural networks in deep learning to create something that learned very quickly the way humans learn. And that is going to be the basis for this talk. We are going to look at the techniques that kind of you know, underlined this AlphaGo achievement, and we'll see that they are transferable to all realms of you know, computation that are important to us. So, let us back up just a little bit and talk about neural networks. Right? And this will be a review for some of you that have you know, studied these. So a neural network, very simply, is just a computational model that emulates the human brain. And so to understand how neural networks work, we in fact need to go to Biology 101. Never thought you'd see this in a tech talk. And understand a little bit about the human mind. Right? So right now, as I talk, Right? In your cranium, there's a three-pound packet of tissue that is probably the most awesome device in the cosmos that we have today. Okay? It is quite incredible. You have about 100 billion neural cells, or what are called neurons, that are connected through 100 trillion axons. Right? And there is nothing that we have in the universe, virtually or organically, that rivals the complexity of what is in your mind right now. Electrochemical signals propagate between the various neurons in your mind, and that electrochemical dance provides the basis for consciousness, for your mental computations. As I speak right now to you and you're processing what I'm saying, your brain is processing all these things electrochemically. And we still have a very dim understanding of the connection between you know, how those things work and what fuels very high human concepts like morality, and um, your, your decisions of right and wrong and so forth. Nonetheless, there is a esoteric discipline of neuroscience called cognitive neuromodeling. And what cognitive neuromodeling says is that when you think about something, that thing that you are thinking about has an analogy in your brain as to how the neurons kind of line up and fire together. What that means is that if I ask you to think of an apple and an orange, Generally speaking, generally speaking, the neural activation pattern will be similar. If I ask you to, to think of something completely different, the neural activation will be different. Okay, to illustrate this, here up on the screen here, I have three faces. I have a gender ambiguous face that is sandwiched between two regular human faces. Now, the theory of visual science tells us that if I ask you, everybody in this audience, to stare at the male face for about 10 seconds, Okay, as I ask you to do now. And then I ask you to interpret this face here. Most people in the audience will interpret this as female. Not all of you, most of you. Now, if I ask you to do the reverse, and I ask you to stare on the female face for about 10 seconds, and then I show you the gender ambiguous face, most of you will do the reverse. You'll interpret this as male. Right now, why does that happen? That happens because as you're staring at a face that is classically one gender, the neural activation pattern becomes saturated in your mind, such that when you stare at an ambiguous face after that, your brain interprets it in the opposite direction. Okay, so what this illustrates is that there is a relationship between what you are thinking about and the neural activation pattern in your mind that makes that mental reflection a reality. So a neural network, then, is simply a structure that emulates the biology of the brain that I showed you, right? So it has a number of inputs, it has a number of connections between those inputs, the equivalent of axons in your brain. There are weights that multiply or, you know, depress the signal, depending on what exactly it is you're talking about, and you have a number of outputs, right? Now, to better understand neural networks, let's ask or go through a simple exercise. And that is, how can we train a neural network 
to recognize something as simple as a dog. Prior to neural networks, the theory for doing this, okay, the computer graphical theory, the scientists who tried to do this mathematically, really struggled with the problem. Because while it is obvious to you guys, and even a five-year-old, if I show you a picture of a dog, you'll know it's a dog, to describe that with precision to a computer in mathematical terms is very difficult. Because there are so many variations between what a dog looks like. There's texture, there's shadow, there's angles, right? So let's take a look at how neural networks do this. Now, the first thing we do is we divide this picture of a dog into many pixels, right? And here's the thing. A dog is made up, unsurprisingly, of things that are characteristically dog. It has two eyes. There's a certain ratio of its pupils. There's a certain ratio of the nose to the eyes and so forth. And so those things become inputs into the neural network. And the same thing would apply to another animal like a cat, right? Things that are characteristically cat would be inputs into the neural network as well. So there's a relationship between these pixels that on average will describe one of these animals. And so what happens with neural networks is I basically take the contents, I slice them up, those become inputs into my neural network, and I start training the neural network to differentiate between different types of images. And the more data I have, the better the neural network actually gets at this. Now let's anchor this in some practical example, right? So here I have a neural network that has a number of inputs. There's a number of weights between those inputs that, again, multiply or depress the signal, depending on what I want to do. And then I have outputs, and the outputs in this case are simply going to be a probability as to whether or not a given picture is a dog or not. Now, a lot of this is shown to you in the abstract. Okay, in reality, the mathematics behind neural networks are actually quite complex. And a lot of the research and a lot of the theory behind this um, goes into that mathematics. So there are linear you know, weights, there are nonlinear weights, there are statistical relationships. There's the question of how do you take two signals and what do you do with them? And the key to training a neural network is setting those weights appropriately so the neural network becomes good at recognizing a particular image. And so what I actually do is I start with the inputs, and in this case, these would be the pixels for the image, and I simply set the weights at random. Okay, and then I do what's called a feed-forward pass, and I get an output here. Now, because the weights are set at random, the data that I get in the output is usually random as well, which means, on average, the network won't be that great at telling me that a picture of a dog is, in fact, a picture of a dog. But here's the key point about neural networks and deep learning. I know as the system designer whether or not what I'm giving the neural network is a picture of a dog or not, right? So because I know the answer ahead of time, I then work backwards using what's called a backward propagation pass, and I basically start setting the weights in reverse. And if I do this hundreds of thousands of times, even millions of times, through a training mechanism, eventually I will get a neural network that gets extremely skilled and very adept at recognizing dogs. Okay? And so in practice, neural networks that do this okay, have millions, sometimes billions of parameters. They are several layers deep, and that is where the term deep learning comes from. All right? Now again, as I mentioned, up here, I've really shown this to you in a very simple way. Right? In practice, if you ever study this at a very deep level, you'll see that the mathematics behind this are actually quite complex. And a lot of the theory goes into what kind of neural networks I have and how I you know, implement these weights and how I do a backwards propagation pass and so forth. Now, normally when I give this talk, I gloss over this section and I say that the reason why deep networks work, or deep learning works rather, it's sort of magic. It empirically works, but we're not exactly sure why it works. And this used to be the case for the longest time. It's not dissimilar from the human brain, right? There's very little that we understand really about how the human brain works. But I know from a learning perspective that it works. I know, for example, that if I have a child that is a newborn and I expose them to a language, you know, your native language, whatever it is, after about two years, they slowly start to develop faculty in that language. Right? And after about five years, they are fluent in the language, or close to fluent. Now, the, re the reality is, we don't understand how the brain is actually doing this. 
We simply know that if we expose the child to parents who are talking in an environment in which, you know, that language is spoken, as if by osmosis almost, the child learns to speak that particular language, right? So there's actually been some recent work done now in really trying to understand why deep learning works. Not that it works, we know that it works, why does it work so effectively? Okay, there's a very instrumental paper that came out actually about a month ago by two physicists, believe it or not, from MIT, and they actually went into this question very deeply. And they actually came up with a term that I don't like, but it, it sort of describes what's going on called cheap learning. And what they say is that it is quite incredible that a neural network with only millions of parameters can understand data that is a lot more complex. Okay, to give you an example, and I'm going to use a, a colleague's brain teaser. Alberto's here. He's a colleague of mine. He gave us a brain teaser uh, a few years ago. I don't know if he remembers. He basically said, consider an image on a monitor that's 1,024 by 768. So old resolution from the 1990s, right? And each pixel in that monitor can take on one of 16.7 million colors, so true RGB. How many permutations, do you remember this? How many permutations can you have of different images on that monitor? Right? It's not that hard. 16.7 million times itself, 1,024 by 768. So basically 16.7 million to the power of 1,024 by 768, a gargantuan number, a huge number, a number that is, you know, larger than the number of atoms in the universe almost by the factor of itself, right? So that's the state space we are working with. That's how many permutations of images I can have. Now imagine I asked everybody in the audience here to draw a giraffe, as an example. Some of you are probably good artists, you would draw it very nicely. Some of you, like me, are hopeless, but you'd have something that sort of looks like a giraffe. And imagine I wanted to train a neural network to use that data set and understand what a giraffe looks like. The reality is, even though there's all these possibilities in the state space, the giraffes that we all draw would be relatively close together, right? They would have long necks, they would have a face that has a certain angle of those necks and so forth. And so in the grand scheme of things, even though I'm working with so many possible images, there's only so many giraffes that we could all draw that would characteristically be giraffes, right? So the state space of what I'm looking at is actually very small. So this is actually what they mean by cheap learning, right? Even though I'm operating on data that is so fantastically complex, really I can do it with a lot number, you know, a lot less number of parameters. Okay, they call it a combinatorial swindle. And if you're really interested, I'd highly recommend you read that paper. Now here was their key insight into this paper, and I think this is just remarkable. The reason that this is possible has nothing to do with mathematics, but actually physics. Okay, the physical nature of the universe makes this kind of thing possible. What do I mean by that, right? Our universe can be described by something called polynomial Hamiltonians. This is for, you know, graduates in physics. What this basically means is that the equations that govern the physical world, particle physics, fluid dynamics, electrodynamics, electromagnetism, they exhibit properties of symmetry and hierarchy and so forth, that really make this kind of thing efficient, right? And you think about the hierarchical world. We have atoms that make molecules, molecules that make organisms, and so forth. The equations that govern these things are based on principles of supersymmetry, simplicity, lowest state energy, and so forth. And so the reality is that the data sets that we are interested in as human beings, right? Music, language, images, are all going to exhibit the properties that you see that govern the fabric of the cosmos, basically. And it's those hierarchies that allow deep learning to work effectively. Put another way, if for some reason we all drew giraffes, if there was a world where a giraffe was completely random data to you and completely random data to somebody else, and that actually made sense to us as an alien species, deep learning would not work, right? It's the fact that the physical universe is designed the way it is that makes this kind of thing possible. Put another way, our brains evolved, right? According to the parameters of the universe around us. So the things that are important to us now, you can see why when we design a virtual entity that is the same as the human brain, you can see why it works. Okay, and to me that is just fascinating. That is just incredible. 
Okay, and here you have the, an, uh, basically a diagram from that paper that shows complexity at various scales of the cosmos and how they really all relate in terms of symmetry and so forth. Okay, so returning back to AlphaGo then. The makers of AlphaGo used two neural networks. Okay, they used a value network to evaluate board positions, a policy network to select moves, and they augmented it with a clever technique known as a Monte Carlo search tree. So those of you in computer science have probably heard of Monte Carlo simulations, right? Which is based on randomized data. Interesting factoid there, I just learned this recently. The mathematician who came up with the Monte Carlo theory, the reason he named it Monte Carlo is his cousin would constantly go to Monte Carlo, it's a true story, and gamble and lose all his money. And he basically told his cousin, you'd be better off just playing randomly than actually trying any strategy. And his cousin, who is a degenerate gambler, basically inspired the whole Monte Carlo name that we give this theory. Okay, and there's also specialized hardware now for uh, neural networks. So there are actually things called tensor processing units, which are wired hardware that basically mirror the setup of um, you know, uh, neural networks to make things faster. So just as in 1997, the makers of Deep Blue designed specific hardware for the game of chess, with AlphaGo, the, the makers of DeepMind designed specific hardware for neural networks. And that's what makes it so efficient. And so as AlphaGo was developed, and the reason this happened so fast and caught people unaware was it did two rigorous training sessions. So a supervised learning technique where the network calibrated itself by working through thousands of master level games and reinforcement learning where the computer played itself to get better. The analogy I like to draw here is that of The Matrix, right? You guys have seen the movie The Matrix with Keanu Reeves, I hope. I'm getting old. No, some of you haven't seen it. Wow, that really dates me. There's this part where Keanu Reeves is in this virtual world and he's hooked up to a machine and he, you know, he starts shaking and three minutes later he wakes up and he says, I know karate, because he's learned a lifetime of karate in three minutes. And then he fights with Lawrence Fishburne and they have this dramatic scene. That's sort of what AlphaGo did. In about like, you know, a day, it learned what, an Alpha, what a Go master would learn in a lifetime, right? And when you put supercomputing hardware behind it, to me it's even remarkable that the human won a single game. Now here's the fascinating thing. If this, if this idea of training you know, and getting better seems similar to how we humans learn, that's because it is, right? There's an idea called deep practice. It was written, it was kind of founded by this guy named Daniel Cole, who wanted to understand how humans got to super high levels of performance, right? So he studied soccer players in Brazil, Russian, you know, tennis players, um, music academy players in upstate New York, you know, areas of the world that produced a disproportionate amount of really high achievers. And he basically discovered that high facility in all these things was built on something called deep practice. Okay, and he wrote, deep, pa deep practice is built on a paradox. Struggling in certain targeted ways, operating at the edges of your ability when you make mistakes makes you smarter, or to put it slightly differently, experiences where you're forced to slow down, make errors and correct them as you would if you were walking up an ice-covered hill, slipping and stumbling as you go, end up making you swift and graceful without you realizing it. Right? And he actually had some neuroscience to back this up. Okay? So there's something called myelin, which is a substance that basically wraps around the synapses of your brain, the connectors on the axons. And as you start practicing and doing something repeatedly, the myelin in those areas of the brain that are activated become stronger. Right? And so this basically founds the idea that practice makes perfect. Um, I don't know how many of you are sports fans, but I'm a huge tennis fan. And my favorite player is Roger Federer. And I've been lucky enough to see him play twice, both times at the US Open. So I saw him play in 2007 against Andy Roddick in the quarterfinal. And last year, I was really lucky. I got to, got to see him play Novak Djokovic in the final. And when you see world-class players in anything, you know, be it football or tennis or you know, volleyball or what have you, it really seems magic as, in terms of what they're doing. I mean, these guys are hitting a ball hundreds of miles an hour, you know, and it literally goes on the line. It's just incredible, and it seems like magic. What you don't see is the thousands of hours that go into making that skill seem seamless, right? And it's just as simple as something as speaking a language. If you look at people who speak a completely different language, it literally looks like another world, another skill. But remember, there was a time when you as an individual didn't speak even the language that is your native tongue. You learned it over time. And so the idea of deep practice is very much connected to the idea of deep learning. Okay? Now, the fact of the matter is, 
neural networks still don't approach anywhere near the complexity of the human brain. Right? Even if you look at the most complex neural networks, they still don't approximate how incredibly dense, in the good way, and uh, complex your mind is. Okay, but what they lack in density, they make up for in computational power. Right? And so this is AlphaGo learning and being able to look at every single master game that was ever done in history in a matter of hours, whereas it would take a human a lifetime. Okay? And in practice, we have many types of neural networks, convolutional neural networks, which are really good at recognizing images, recurrent neural networks, which are good at language. And so if you get into the theory of some of these things, you'll see there are different designs depending on the particular operation that you want to undertake. Okay, so what are some of the amazing things that neural networks can do today? Okay, one of the ones I've been talking about is recognizing images. So they can, you know, given a picture, tell you with certain probability what this is a picture of. Right? So the one that's interesting to me is the leopard. They think it's a leopard. It might be a jaguar. They're not sure. I don't even know if most humans could do that. Okay? Another thing they can do. Given an image, describe the contents of that image in colloquial English. So imagine being given an image and a computer telling you, yeah, this is two kids playing with a dog in a field. Right? We would give that to a child and think there's not a big deal with a child doing that. The fact that a computer can do that is just amazing. And in fact, you know, they've done this through uh, two neural networks. Okay, one neural network to kind of break down the image, another to describe in language what that is an image of. Okay, and these are publicly available APIs. Okay, so you can now use APIs that actually have deep learning vision algorithms behind them. Okay, one of them is Google's. So you can see here a picture, and I'll give you back some JSON of exactly what that, that is an image of. This is IBM's. Okay, this is Wolfram, another one. So oftentimes when you look at these deep vision APIs, they basically give you a very simple image, right? I mean, it's obvious this is a dog. This is an easy image for a machine to process. So I thought, let's test this for real. Let's actually give the vision API something more complex. Uh, so a few months ago, I went to Pittsburgh with my wife and I decided, let me take a random sampling of the pictures from my trip and give it to the various APIs and see what they come up with. So here's a picture of the Pittsburgh skyline. Okay, and you can see that Wolfram correctly identifies it as a bridge. IBM Watson doesn't know what it is. Google picks out the bridge, a reservoir, a river, a landform. Okay, Microsoft's Vision API also picks out everything quite successfully. Okay, this was the drink that I had in the hotel bar with my wife. This is an old-fashioned, the drink I've recently learned to appreciate. So Wolfram thinks it's a substance. I'm not sure what they meant by substance. Like, yes, it's a substance. Everything's a substance. But do they mean an illicit substance, maybe? Okay, Watson again had an error. Google, alcoholic beverage, 83%. It even tries to guess. It thinks it's a Mai Tai, but with less probability. Okay, and you can see, like, Microsoft Vision API gets that it's a table, a cup, and that there's a drink as well. Okay, that was my dinner that night, so Wolfram says it's a dish. Again, did they mean, like, the dish dish, or that, you know, as a, a dish to eat? Watson said it was food. Google. Microsoft. All right, let's try things that are a little more complex. Okay, so here's a picture outside the baseball park. And my wife is in this picture, and she's imitating a baseball player. Right? So a lot of things going on in this picture. I thought this would be a good test. Let's see how the Vision APIs do. Wolfram thinks it's a shopping center, which you can sort of see, right? Like, I mean, a lot of shopping centers would have this kind of design, maybe the parking lot. Um, Watson thought it was a wheel. <laughs> I guess it thinks the, you know, the circle at the bottom there. Google, nope, vehicle, aircraft. OK. Uh, Microsoft. Okay, let's try one more. This is me in the baseball park. All right, so Wolfram gets that it's a ballpark. Nicely done. Watson, it's a sport of some kind, and yeah, reasonable percentage that it's baseball. My favorite is Google. Stadium, 96%. Team sport, 94%. Ball game, 93%. Athlete, 88%. <laughs> Google is totally right. We're only using Google from now on. Google thinks I'm an athlete, so I don't have to work out anymore. That's what I tell my wife. All right. Um, sorry, I have a few more. This is a mascot inside the grounds. Wolfram thinks it's a boxing glove. Watson, crowd and sport. Ba Google, Google basketball moves. I'm not even sure what they're talking about. Microsoft gets that it's a crowd. Okay, and one more, sorry. This is a picture of a peanut roasting machine. 
So just we were walking randomly down the streets. I don't even know how a human would describe this. Let's see what our vision APIs make of it. Okay, Wolfram thinks it's a switch. Watson just blows up. Watson thinks it's a knot. <laughs> Google thinks it's a distilled beverage. <laughs> and Microsoft, hey, they get to bricks or whatever. Okay. Um, interestingly, what they found with vision APIs, so they, they actually ran these across like hundreds of thousands of images and they compared them to how humans did. And what they found was that the machines were actually better than most humans because they could get more granular. They could tell you not only that this was a jungle cat, but this was the species of jaguar. But the difference was when, and you can see this here, when the Vision API got it wrong, it got it fantastically wrong. It was way off in a way that a human would never be off. Okay, and that is why if you actually see some of the ticket, you know, different ticket sites now where you buy tickets, it'll actually say, identify the four tigers in here because it's still hard to get some of these. Okay, what are, what are some of the other things that neural networks can do? They can play video games. That is, you can simply give them a video game with a certain number of inputs, and it can just learn what sequence of inputs will actually get it to a higher level. Okay? They can save money, all right? And so Google basically gave its neural network the responsibility of determining the parameters to control its data center to save its power cost, right? So the Googleplex that basically fuels Google contains hundreds of thousands of computers. And of course, the electricity bill and the air conditioning bill for Google is gargantuan. It's huge, hundreds of millions of dollars per month. So there's 120 variables that go into running this data center, fans, cooling system, windows. They had a neural network basically analyze the inputs and determine the most efficient way to set up the hardware, to turn things off and so forth. And that resulted in a saving of 15%, which is hundreds of millions of dollars per month. So they simply can save money. Okay, here's an interesting one. Neural networks can dream. Okay, what does that mean? Well, if we train a neural network to recognize an image, right, we can also say, well, you know what a dog looks like, right, if I give you an image, now tell me based on your inputs what you think a dog looks like by just showing me an image of one. And so here's what one neural network came up when it was asked to envision different things that it could detect, right? So you can see an ant, you can see the big eyes, right? A screw, you can see the general outline of a screw. Fascinating. Okay, a really cool technique that's come to light is that of inceptionalism, where a neural network basically takes two images and it combines them into a mind-bending third. Okay, this technique was basically popularized in Russia. Now, if you think this is an experimental technique, this has actually found its way into the mainstream. There's an app right now you can download on your iPhone or Android called Prisma, which will basically apply these filters to pictures that you give it, right? And so here's some of the ones I did. This is my wife with her sister. It turned it into this. This is my buddy with his son. It turned it into this. And this was my sister when she was one years old with my mom. And it turned, turned it into this. I remember sending this to my mom. She thought I hired a painter to do this. And literally, it did it in like three or four seconds. Okay, this app, by the way, if you download it, um, you know, it'll keep you up at nights because you can do so many cool things with all the pictures that you have. Um, and they apply new filters every month. Okay, let's talk a little bit just about some of the applications of neural networks. So there's obviously many, right? There is uh, natural language, you're seeing that. There's analytical data, that's a big one. There's image recognition. Okay, one of the ones that in the enterprise we are seeing a lot of noise around is that of a bot. Okay, so a bot is simply a virtual entity that you interact with as if it was a human being. Right? So you ask it questions, it understands your natural language, it responds accordingly. And so what you will sometimes hear in the language of the enterprise is that bots reverse the paradigm of human-computer interaction. So normally, we as humans have had to adapt to machines, right? I mean, there was the computers, and you guys might be too young to remember this, where you didn't have a mouse even, right? You didn't even have a fancy screen. You had DOS, you had a command prompt. And so you have to understand all these arcane commands. Right now, of course, it's a little more intuitive. You can actually use a mouse. You can interact. There's some you know, human sensitivity behind the machine you're interacting with. What they say now is that with bots, machines now are adapting to us. They are understanding English. right? And so they actually have to understand what we say. And so there are many types of bots, entertainment bots, consumer-focused bots, utility ones, customer service. I'm working with a bank right now in Canada 
where they are trying to cut down their call center volume. And so basically, instead of a person actually interacting with and talking to um, a human, they actually ask questions and get a completely valid English response with a machine on the other end. Okay? Um, bots actually have a fascinating history. The first bot, we could say, was something called ELIZA, which was published uh, in 1966. And it was actually written uh, by a computer scientist slash psychiatrist who wanted to give his lonely psychiatric patients uh, some company. And so he basically designed a very, very simple computer interface that would basically respond to human questions or human statements with, you know, ambiguous questions, right? So somebody would say something, it would be like, tell me more. Uh, my wife's a psychiatrist, incidentally, and I was describing this technique to her, and she's like, yeah, that's essentially what we do. We just basically volley back to them to try to get more information. And so this was the first bot that we had in history, and in the, the maker was basically hor horrified to discover that in psych psychiatric homes, they had set up these terminals so that people would actually have company instead of having to interact with humans, and he shut the whole project down. But we actually had the very primitive version of a bot way back in 1966. Now, some of the challenges with bots, right? Um, it's not a paradigm that we, in this day and age, are used to. Imagine if you were told you could just speak to a computer, like you would be like, whoa, like, what do I say? How do I say it? Is there, you know, whereas they find with children, children will just start talking to it like it's a human being, and it'll understand them. Um, we're still trying to, you know, improve natural language recognition. It's getting a lot better, as you probably saw with IBM Watson in, you know, 2011, but we still lose a lot, right? There's sentiment you don't get. There's, you know, turns of phrase. There are idioms in language that you sometimes miss. So we still need a lot of work there. Um, how do you actually authenticate somebody? This is a very important question in the enterprise. Somebody picks up their phone and wants to transfer money. How do you know that that's really them? All right? The other kind of um, uh, cousin of the bot is a so-called agent. And so an agent is basically a representative of a, sorry, it's basically your, your, um, like your assistant, right? And so instead of a bot that you're talking to, an agent is like Siri or Cortana on your phone that, you know, can say, um, you know, do you want me to look for the cheapest flight to Toronto? I know you're going back in three days. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Her that came out a couple of years ago with Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson. Has anybody seen it here? Yeah? That's basically, you know, the, the ideal, I wouldn't say the ideal, that's basically uh, the vision of what an agent can eventually be. Okay, can eventually be almost a person that acts as your personal assistant, and because of the mounds of data that it has available to them, it basically knows how you work, knows how you operate, and essentially works, you know, as an assistant that is assisting you full time. And you can see the beginnings of this, right, with things like Cortana and so forth. Okay, so a lot of opportunity here, guys, and the key point to realize is that a lot of the computational power that fuels a lot of this are deep networks that have been refined and improved over time. Okay, for the final section uh, of this talk, I basically want to talk about stuff that is way out there, stuff that, you know, is maybe 20 or 30 years away, um, but it's probably the logical conclusion of where this stuff is eventually going, right? Um, I don't know how many of you have heard the term pie in the sky. No? Okay, so pie in the sky, basically in English, means things that are, you know, fanciful, things that are a dream lover thing, like, you know, maybe one day we might be able to fly, or, you know, things that are completely out there. It actually comes from a poem that somebody wrote during World War I, believe it or not. Um, one of the things that science cannot yet do effectively is explain consciousness, right? Science can explain a lot. Particle physics can explain how the universe works at the macro scale. General relativity can explain how it works at the, sorry, micro scale and macro scale. But we still don't have a very good understanding of how the material in your mind, how this three pound packet of tissue in your mind gives you as a human being consciousness. Right? You are a conscious human being, a plant is not, but you guys are both made up of atoms and quarks and leptons and all the other fundamental building blocks of matter. Um, there's actually a branch of neuroscience called NCC, which stands for Neural Correlates of Consciousness. And this refers to the mechanisms that people and scientists are trying to identify to actually understand how consciousness works. 
Okay, and there's all these theories for consciousness. There's one that it's an electromagnetic magnetic field. Um, there's you know, some that say it's quantum effects that may actually result in consciousness. The reality is we still don't really understand how consciousness works. Now, where am I going with this? Well, many people believe that eventually, with neural networks approximating what we do so effectively, we are heading towards conscious thinking machines. Right? That is what is known as the inflection point of AI. When will we have, or will we ever have, a machine that is a conscious entity the way you are a conscious entity? And how will that happen? Um, there are some who believe that when you create a neural network that you know, just approaches the density of our minds, that will result in consciousness. It'll simply be a self-realizing achievement. There are others who say that the fact that we are conscious has to do with things that are not material in us, right? And you can see the spiritual, metaphysical, religious implications of that, a soul, so to speak. Um, and so this will explore some very tricky questions. Now, there is a connected achievement to consciousness, and that is superintelligence. Okay, and superintelligence basically is the belief that eventually we will create a intelligence that supersedes our own intelligence. And so what happens with using the techniques of neural networks and deep learning and so forth, we eventually create an intelligence that exceeds our own. Um, if you're interested in this topic, there's a fascinating book by Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence, where he, ex he you know, explores all the possibilities and moral and ethical questions that we need to grapple with with this possibility. Okay, there's a very select group of scientists right now that are dealing with the ethics of how we handle this type of scenario. Because, of course, once we unleash a superintelligence, if we haven't programmed it with some control or morality or something, the implications could be devastating. And, of course, Hollywood has been inspired by all these doomsday scenarios with superintelligent machines, right? Uh, to give you an example, one of the things that Bostrom talks about is imagine we instruct a superintelligence to ensure happiness of the human, human race, right? So we say simply, your job is to make humans happy. And Bostrom gives the example of the superintelligence then modifying our brains using electromagnetic impulses to simulate happiness in all of us, right? So we haven't given parameters of what happiness means, so it finds a way to give us happiness um, to you know, qualify the, uh, the result, or the ask, but not what we intended, right? So these are some of the things that make you know, this a very, very thorny topic. Um, but many people feel that this is where we are going with deep learning. Now, I think we're probably 35 years away at least from this. Some people think more, some people think less. But in the short term, you can certainly see the power of deep learning, I hope, right? They approximate the human brain. Amazingly, it seems to be because of the fabric of the cosmos and the way physical structures are actually designed. Um, and they can now do things that approximate the things that we do, right? They can recognize images, they can recognize language, they can operate on that. A final point that I'll make here is there could be some fascinating economic implications behind what superintelligence and deep learning can achieve. Right? Machines in the Industrial Revolution took away blue-collar jobs from humanity. Right? There was no longer horse drivers. There was no longer you know, a lot of factory workers because a lot of things were automated. What happens when deep learning and expert systems and so forth begin to take away white-collar or you know, um, other types of jobs like you know, computer programming or um, you know, uh, certain things in the medical field or lawyer services and so forth? Okay. All right, guys. So I hope this has been an interesting talk. There's a lot of potential here. I would highly encourage you to explore deep learning um, in a deeper way, pun intended. And um, I will stick around for any questions and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks.